Okay, uh, we're going to finish up uh, lesson 16. Uh, I got uh, pretty far into it on Wednesday. I just want to highlight a little bit, and then we're going to get into uh, lesson 17. Um, if you want to open your Bibles to uh, John chapter 4, we're going to review just a little bit, uh, starting in verse 27. Uh, at this point, the disciples came back from town from buying food. And they, they, they marveled that Jesus was talking to a, a, a woman. And uh, they, uh, but yet no one asked the woman, what do you seek? And the reason they didn't ask that, they would have been guilty of the same astonishment that they had that Jesus was talking to the woman. So they didn't do that. Nor did they ask Jesus, why are you talking with her? We talked about the possibilities that maybe uh, they didn't want to make an awkward situation worse, uh, uh, embarrass Jesus, if that's possible. Um, and so they didn't ask that. Uh, the woman left, uh, got up so abruptly and went back to town that she left her water pot uh, and went to the city to tell the men. And she made the comment, come, see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Uh, then they came uh, to him. In the meantime, uh, the disciples urged Jesus to eat. In, in verse uh, uh, 31, it says, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Now, I find it kind of amusing, just me, maybe that's. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. And then in verse 33, therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? I mean, they, how could they? They were all together when they were buying the food, so that, that answer is kind of, I don't know, or question is kind of funny. Um, then Jesus explains what kind of food he's talking about in verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then we uh, wound up or uh, ended uh, Wednesday night with talking about verses 35 and 36. Uh, do you not say that there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And then verse 36 says, And he who reaps wages, he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. And we mentioned that this statement of the four months is, is, is open to really two interpretations. Uh, one, very simply, this incident uh, at the well with the Samaritan woman could have had, uh, taken place in maybe December or January, and four months later would have been the normal harvest time uh, back there. Uh, according to this interpretation, uh, Jesus uh, would be saying, you say that four more months must pass before harvest time, but there is a harvest already uh, for reaping speaking of the people of the city who were coming out to see him after the Samaritan woman had told him what had happened. The other second interpretation, or the other interpretation could be, since Jesus said, do you not say, that's in the first part of verse 35, he may have been quoting a proverbial expression, four more months than the harvest. In this case, Jesus was alluding to the coming of the Samaritans when he continued but I say the seed has just been sown, and the harvest is here already. Whatever the exact meaning of the four months may be, Jesus was stressing the importance and urgency of his work. And that's where we, we left off on Wednesday. Now, in verse 36, uh, again, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruits for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. The New American Standard in the ESV says already. In the New American Standard in the ESV, the word already can be attached to the end of verse 35, as, as it is in the New King James Version, or at the beginning of verse 36, as it is in the New American Standard and ESV. Either is possible in the Greek language. Perfectly okay. If joined to verse 35, the idea is that the fields were already uh, for harvest. 
with no interval between sowing and harvesting like the response of the Samaritans. They immediately came. If joined to verse 36, then the reaper uh, is said to be already at work in the harvest, already receiving his wages and already gathering fruit for eternal life. Um, verse 38. Well, we, we said that in verse 37 uh, is a metaphor of the harvest used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now, verse 38 serves as a stern reminder. Let's read it together. This is new. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. This was a reminder to the apostles that the great ingathering they were about to see, in other words, the Samaritans coming up, was in no sense a result of their own effort or ability, but that they, the disciples, were to consider themselves instruments of God in reaping the fruit of the labors of others. And that's a key point, I think. Verse 39 through 42 uh, kind of is a summation of this story. Uh, read with me if you would. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this indeed, the Christ, the Savior of the world. It's interesting that Jesus made, I mean, think about the, the lesson here to, that can be learned. Jesus made a simple request for a drink of water. He was thirsty. But in doing so, he taught in a profound way that gender, race, or religion would not stop him from accomplishing his work. Boy, that's a lesson for all of us to learn. Jesus never broke the law given by God, for he was sinless. Hebrews 4 and 15 tells us that. On the other hand, he sometimes ignored traditions and customs of the day to help someone believe in him. Perfectly okay. Whether a person was like Nicodemus, a Jewish man, outstanding teacher, religious leader, or like the Samaritan woman, uneducated and morally corrupt, Jesus did not hesitate to communicate with any potential believer. Any potential believer. Think about the lesson that we can learn from that story. Any thoughts or comments as we bring this to a close and before we answer your questions? Jack. That's right. Yeah, we're we're gonna as we get into lesson seventeen, we're gonna we're gonna study his miracles. But the, uh, and there's a comparison, a contrast made between the Samaritans who believe because of the word, and you know, yeah, it, it's going to be dealing with the, the the nobleman here in a moment. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh huh. I guess my I would have to think about this a little bit more and do some studying on it uh, before I would uh, you know lean one way or another. Uh, 
I, I do believe that what he's talking about it, uh, to the uh, disciples for sure is that, hey, I, I, I've done some work here, and you're going to come in here and inherit this, you know, but by no means it was nothing that you did, you know, uh, yet. And so, anyway, that's my thought. But, but good comment. I like that. Makes me think. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Oh, they did. I mean, the, the relationship between Samaritans and the Jews were, I mean, we, we went back in history, all that, that uh, hate, were, hatred for each other and the distrust that was between them. I mean, and uh, the, the different notions they had about each other. That's right. Brian. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it uh, it's on the front. Yeah, well put on the front burner. Other comments. All right, let's look at our questions for lesson sixteen. I use the individual study guide. Um, the other one and this one are very similar. I think this has one more question to it, so I went with the the more um, harder one. Um, Number one, what was the common route taken by most Jews from Judah or Judea to Galilee? Yeah, the long way. They went east, crossed the River Jordan, went up the River Jordan to see a Galilee, went back west, and they were there, there they were there. Took two or three extra days. Either way was a hard journey. Either way was a hard journey. What was the route Jesus took from Judea to Galilee? Straight through. Shortest distance between two, two points, straight line. And that's what he did. Why did Jesus have to pass through Samaria? Why did he have to? Remember it said he had to go through. Exactly. He had to meet this woman. It was a divine calling, if you will. A very teachable moment. Um. We talked about just a little bit ago, how did the Jews ver uh, view the Samaritans? Yeah, contempt, hated, they were half-breeds, mongrels. Boy, that's bad. Um, where did Jesus meet the Samaritan woman at? At the well. What well? Jacob's well. Yep. Number six, what were the results of Jesus' teaching the Samaritan woman? Oh, I, I mean, think about it for a minute. Uh, she became a believer. She went and told others. They came. They believed. Many, many, many. Absolutely. And where is it said that uh, Jesus, or where is it that Jesus did his greatest work? In Galilee. In Galilee. Any closing comments on lesson 16? Exactly right. He, he, he broke uh, tradition in so many levels. One, speaking to a Samaritan. Two, a woman. Three, asking for a drink and using utensils provided by the Samaritans. Unclean. Ed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, what a change transformation. Yeah. They, they, they were all kind of twisted out of shape about it. I mean, they didn't have the, 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 the right concept and idea because they wrote the first five books of the Bible themselves how they wanted to. I mean, translate it in whatever fit them. Uh, they, had, they had a different version of it. But, yeah, it, it, everybody, you're right. Other closing comments? Okay, let's get into uh, 17. Got a switch, no pen. Should have bought stock in legal pad. Um, you may have noticed 
that lesson 17 is kind of, I'm going to use the word disjointed. It jumps around. In, in, in Roper's book, uh, we, we start off on page 144 and go uh, to 148. Then we jump over to 159 through 174. And if you look at the text, uh, there's a lot of text. We compare the different uh, uh, miracles uh, by the different uh, gospel writers. Uh, for the most part, it's pretty close to being the same. You'll pick up a few uh, different details from one uh, from another. Um, so anyway, as we begin... After several days with the Samaritans, Jesus and the disciples resumed their journey, traveling northward until they reached the southern hills of Galilee. Now Christ would do his greatest work in this province. Question. Since Jerusalem and Judea were the heart of Judaism at the time, why did Jesus concentrate his efforts in Galilee? Any thoughts to that? More populated? Yes, that is correct. It was. What else? Maybe. Well, Roper says there are three possible factors. Remember, Jesus had grown up in Galilee. So it was the region with which he was most familiar with. You know, you like to go back to your old stomping grounds, don't you? Because you're familiar with it. Um, as you said, Galilee was more populous. Uh, was the most populous area. And number three, as a rule, Galileans were more receptive than Judeans, being less enamored, meaning caught up with religious traditions. You know, it's interesting, and I didn't know this, that all of the apostles were Galileans except Judas. I did not know that. Yeah. News of Jesus' ministry in Judea preceded him. Look at John 4, 45. It says, So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. John inserts a strange note here in verse 44. He says, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. What do you think John meant by that? Why did he write that? Any thoughts? Well, yeah. This could be part of the explanation of why Jesus left Judea. Uh, everywhere else in the gospel accounts, however, Galilee is presented as Jesus' own country. He's on his own turf, as we said earlier. Has home field advantage, which we know is good. Um, but perhaps this is Jesus looking into the future, indicating that he knew that this warm welcome in Galilee would not last. And there's different scriptures, Matthew 13, 57, Mark 6 and 4, Luke 4 and 24, that allude to that. As we get into the general account of Jesus' teaching in Galilee, the Bible gives us a brief description of what Jesus was preaching when he arrived in Galilee. I need three volunteers, please. Someone please turn to Matthew 4 and 17. Someone please turn to Mark 1, 14 and 15. And then would someone turn to Luke 4, 14 and 15. We're going to read each one, obviously one at a time. Whoever got to Matthew 4 and 17, if you could go ahead. Okay. okay. Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. Uh, Mark 1, 14, 15. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, thank you. And then Luke 4, 14 and 15. Got it, James? He said, Turn in the spirit and reported back to the master of all the brethren saying, We are not in the same way to be glorified. Okay, question. Why do you think Jesus said, Repent first 
and then believe. Is that how we normally do it, if you will? You're exactly right. That's exactly right. Remember, he was talking to the Jews. They uh, were already believers in God, but they needed to repent of their failure to keep God's law. And then, then start believing in Jesus. It was at this time of his ministry that he started performing many of these signs and miracles. It's interesting, Luke wrote, he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. As a rule, synagogues had formal meetings, twice on the Sabbath, once on Monday, and once on Thursday. The Monday and the Thursday gatherings were during market days in many towns, and this would assure a good crowd. Uh, these circumstances provided excellent opportunities for Jesus to teach. Jesus began to perform miracles in Galilee as he had in Judea. Now, question. Can you tell me before this time, what miracles did Jesus do in Judea? The what? That was in Cana. Okay. Not before this time, though. Okay? No, no. I mean, Jesus did some uh, miracles and performed some in, in Judea, but what caught me was it says um, he began doing miracles in Galilee as he had in Judea, and I'm going, what did, wait a minute, the first recorded miracle is the water into wine in Cana, that's Maria. So what? And the point is, it doesn't specifically say, but if you would, turn to John chapter 2. And look at verse 23. John 2 and 23 says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he had did. And then also in chapter 3, verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night, we're talking about Nicodemus here, said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Jesus did them. But we just don't have them recorded. We don't know. We don't know. Um, Luke 4 and 14, the first part of it says that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. What does that mean? Power of the Spirit. Well, yeah, I believe it refers to his exercising the power of the Spirit by, by doing the miracle. Um, now, when did Jesus get this power of the Spirit? When he got baptized, remember the dove? Uh, like, well, like a dove. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that, it, it descended on him like a dove at his baptism. That was when he got it. And as the phrase in 54 says, second sign. Find that here just momentarily. This again is the second sign that Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. The first was obviously turning the water into wine. We know about that. The second one is the healing of the nobleman's son, which we're going to look at here in just a few minutes. Any thoughts or questions so far? Comments? Yes, Brian. Oh, yep, deity. Do signs. That's right. And, and, and think about all the times that Jesus got off by himself and prayed to his father. I mean, he was never far from him. He, he relied on him. He needed him. He, you know, worshipped him. 
if you will. Although they're, yeah, they're all all equal terms. It does make your head spin. Other thoughts? Good comment. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we're going to see that uh, he was allowed to speak on numerous occasions. Uh, numerous occasions. Okay, any other comments before we go on to the second recorded miracle? Okay, if you would, um, again, it's a little bit long, but if someone would read John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54, the, the end for me, that would be helpful. And don't all jump on at one time. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. sir. And Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, and he was with Martha. And a certain nobleman, named Simon, was sick and infirmary. When he heard that Jesus had come out of the Cana of Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you need to see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. And as he was now going down, a certain man told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said again, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same time, or the same hour, which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed, and the whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of the kingdom of God. Thank you. A lot to unpack here. Um, for some reason, Jesus made another visit to the place where he had made the water into wine. Any thoughts of why Jesus returned to Cana? Well, honestly, it's unknown for sure. Uh, perhaps Nathaniel, who was from there, uh, had invited him to his house. Maybe it was just a social car. We don't know. But in nearby Capernaum, a royal official, now my Bible says nobleman, and this literally means king's man, who was probably an official in Herod's court, uh, had a son at the point of death that we read in 46 and 47. Learning that Jesus was in Cana, he hurried to ask him to heal his son. Now, when you look at Jesus' initial response to the official, it's rather unusual. Look at verse 48. Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Well, was this a rebuke of the nobleman? Did Jesus rebuke him? No. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. not a personal rebuke of the nobleman, but rather this was an uh, indictment, if you will, or charge against mankind in general, okay? The word you here is plural in the Greek, meaning unless you people, that's what he's saying, see signs and wonders, you simply won't believe. What is the difference between a sign and a wonder? Signs and wonders? <laughs> I'll tell you. Signs and wonders is not a reference to two kinds of miracles. It's not. But rather to the two qualities in every miracle. Okay? You have the, si the, the miracle itself that you see somebody get here. That, that's, that's the one side. And a wonder is something exciting, phenomenal, extraordinary. And you've got to admit, if you see some 
somebody come up, you know, raised from the dead or get healed from on the verge of death, that's pretty exciting. You would certainly think that. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. See, so many people felt that way. You know, I, you, you got to show me before I believe. It's like, it must have been from Missouri, okay? Uh, and, and it is kind of like that today, too. Remember the Samaritans. Was there, was there any miracle performed there? No. But yet they believed on his word. Okay, and we're going to see that, contrast that in a little bit. Um, well, I just said, it. going back for a moment, we said that this was not a personal rebuke, but perhaps Jesus was contrasting the Galileans with the Samaritans, who believed because in verse 41 of his word, without the need of miracles. Without the need of miracles. Anyway, this did not deter the official, the nobleman. He was bound and determined. To continue, Christ told him, Go, your son lives. Verse 50. And did the nobleman believe? Yes, he had some degree of faith and belief because he left and started that 16 mile trip back to his home. When he arrives home, what did he find? What does he find out? He lives. He lives. Uh, the son had recovered at the exact time that Jesus said he would live. We see that in verse 51 and 53. Now, deeply impressed, I know I would be and you would be, the nobleman himself believed, and who else? His whole household. Again, compare the Samaritan woman to all of the townspeople. Believe this man and all his household. So see how that spread. The good news spread. Exactly. Jesus is no respecter of persons. You know, you can be a, a, a I'm going to use the word low life, uh, scumbag of the world. Okay? A little harsh, I guess. But if you. Turn from your wicked ways and repent and sincerely repent, you know, you're going to be forgiven. You know, I, I, I don't know how true this is, but I just bring it up. Of course, we know how bad that mass murderer Jeffrey Dahmer was. Well, supposedly he was given a Bible in prison, read it, was converted and baptized. Don't know where his heart was. I'm not the judge, but God knows. And I'll tell you this, if he was sincere, he's in heaven. He's in heaven. Okay, so the Samaritans had more faith because they didn't have to see a miracle. That's right. That's right. And that, that, that could be a good way, I mean, a different way to look at it. But, but it's certainly uh, plausible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here we go, uh, you know, the royal official, this nobleman uh, presents a commendable example of a man sharing his faith with his household all the time. It's interesting that only John records, only in the book of John, records the first two miracles of Jesus. There are four more, which we'll discuss later, that are only in John's uh, records also. Just interesting. Any thoughts before we move on? Even after the church was established, there was still a need for the miracles. Well, they still for the same purpose, though, the disciples would share the gospel, the good news, and, and give what's the good news? Incredible miracles. Heal people, fall in the side, and he was brought back to life, things like that. <laughs> We don't have those today. Um, still, any kind of guilt in saying this, because at the time, I couldn't believe it, but um, until he actually 
that it's what Jesus was now a miracle is alive, and that the graves, and Jesus told us, you, you believe because you see him, but more blessed are those who believe and have not that seen him. Yeah. And so even though the scripture says part, you believe without actually ever witnessing the miracle, you know, I have to confess to all of you, I still wish I could have seen something. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. yeah, I mean, Man's inherent characteristic is, you know, we, we say it's too good to be true. And, and sometimes that is true, you know, it's too good to be true. And I think people who heard these things that Jesus did, they wanted to see. I mean, that I, I don't, I guess it's reinforcement. Uh, is it a lack of faith? Because you don't believe unless you see? I mean, that can't be so because we're here today, aren't we? Because we believe. Oh, suffer. Yeah, I mean, I think we can all have probably examples of that what we wish for our family members and things. Uh, amen, amen. I know she's in your heart. That's right. <laughs> yep, yep. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Slow and redemptive. Um, I think as Christians, you know, and, and bless us all that we're here in this room and we, we strive and we're trying and, and uh, you know, I certainly am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I struggle with no, things no. occasionally. Uh, but what I'm trying to get to is I, I have to think about the love and redemption that Christians have to show to those who have seen the light. And where's examples? You know, if there's somebody out there that lived a life that was not a Christian life, and yet they served their time, they did something, and then they found the light of God to, to enter into them, and they changed their life. You know, we as Christians, you know, I think it's a real struggle to, to give somebody the benefit of the doubt that they have changed, because we can be burned by that, but yet. We're also charged by God to forgive and love them. And, and I, I, I've kind of seen that in, 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 a, in a gentleman that I know is life. I mean, he was not a good guy at one point. And uh, he asked occasionally if people believe in the, in, in the, in the forgiveness and redemption. You know, can, can there, is there a, somebody works being redemptive and forgiven? And I, I see that he struggles with that a little bit because... I think he gets rejected a lot of times. People don't want to give him a second shot at things. It's hard to do. I mean, let's just flat out tell it like it is. It's hard to do. I mean, uh, especially if you have been burned once. Uh, reminds me of a story that we'll probably have to end. When I was a, a duty officer uh, one time, I got called uh, to a situation at the barracks where we found some marijuana in one of my uh, uh, crew chiefs locker. Well, he went before the CO for office hours, and I went up there, and I pled my case. Man, I said, this is the only time this ever happened. I, he, in fact, he says it's not his. I believe him, and I mean, I, I, I laid my soul out for this guy. Two days later, they found marijuana again in his locker, you know, and so, my, and bless my CO's heart, he, he didn't rub it in. He just looked at me, and that look was all I needed, you know. Um, but anyway, it's hard to do that. There's so many things you have to take in consideration. Uh, uh, how does it affect the overall congregation? You know, we have our elders, our shepherds, who that's their responsibility to, to oversee the flock. You know, and so there's just a lot of things that come into play when, you know, yes, we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But it's like I tell kids at school, don't ever lie to me. Because once you lie to me, I can never trust you again. 
And that's our human side. You know, even if that kid goes, you know, three years in his senior year, he tells me something, I'm going, oh, you know, when he was a freshman, he lied to me. It, it's just human, humanality. So this is a good place to stop because we're going to pick up the shift to Capernaum uh, on the next lesson, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you so much.